my guy. One, two, one, two. First of all, how's everybody out there doing? All right, all right. And before you start wondering, I was in an accident. Um, cut both my Achilles tendons. Um, had two surgeries, obviously. Then the, with the right leg didn't heal properly, I had to do a third surgery. Um, and during all that time, I developed osteoarthritis in my left leg. Um, if I tell you on a scale of one to 10, the pain was like a 12. So I had to learn how to manage the pain. So it's getting better, you know, through therapy. I was in the um, therapy rehabilitation center for a couple of months. So I'm getting back, and, and, and so I'm getting back to myself. I can actually do like maybe 100 yards with the walker, um, 20 yards with the cane. So this ho hopefully, with all the hard work and dedication to myself, you know, like I kind of put into my label, I'll be okay. You know, I was just going to use that as a segue. Really? Yeah, because it sounds like the music industry. Yeah, it does. It sounds like the music industry, the type of pain and pressure, you know, that makes us great. But I've seen you smiling downstairs. There's a lot of friends you got. Well, you know, listen, you know, everybody's here. It's like, um, we have been together all together in over 30 years. So, 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 so when I, real quickly, it's like, all the kids came home to see Papa for Thanksgiving. So I, <laughs> so I got a real good feeling. Uh, you could have sort of, I wish you could see the joy of everybody seeing each other. It's like a reunion. And, um, you know, listen, it's, it's like I said, it's family. And it's just a great thing going on. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, man. So, so take us back a bit, right? So when was Cold Chilling? even before Cold Chillin', right? Because I was doing my history. And shout out to WBLS, right? You know, before all of this, Hot 97, before all of these radio stations, you know, WBLS was a big part of that, and you were a big part of that. Tell us about the well, beginning you know, between you um, Magic. More than Cold Chillin', you know, to me, what I'm most proud of is I produced the first hip-hop radio show ever. It was called the Mr. Magic Rap Attack. Mr. Magic. And, and my best friend, my brother, was Magic. Uh, he was so far ahead of his time. You know, I wanted, when we started on a little small station you had to pay to be on, called WHBI, we played cassettes. There weren't that many record labels. So we had to play cassettes from kids in the street. And other kids listened to the radio, they would go to record stores, and young people were here. That's where you used to have to go buy your music. <laughs> And the record stores wouldn't know what they were talking about. Eventually, they would call record companies who didn't know what they were talking about. They would ask the kids, where'd you hear this? The Mr. Magic Rap Attack. What's that? <laughs> now, the Mr. Magic Rap Attack came on at 2 in the morning. Yeah. All right? So kids would stay up, tape it, and take it to school the next day. <laughs> and that's how we spread. Eventually, labels like Sugar Hill, and Profile and Tommy Boy start knocking on our door. Whenever they would hear a song that they never heard before, they would come to us. So we made a lot of deals. We made deals with the Four Seventies, Stetsasonic, Eric B. and Rock Kim, Houdini, Roxanne Shante. And this just goes on. And this is all before we're thinking about having a label. And then me, Marley, and Magic just one day decided, let's try our hand at it. And the first label we had was called Bridge Records. For the song I Call the Bridge. All right? The bridge, the bridge sold a lot of records. We got jerked. We didn't know the game. The strippers wouldn't pay us. Manufacturers over, overcharged us. But we didn't get upset. We took it like a lesson. We learned what not to do the next time. And so by the time we started Cold Chillin', we were ready, we knew the game, and we enlisted a guy named Lenny Fisherberg, who knew retail and wholesale. We knew how to make records, 
I don't know if you've ever heard of a story that's called Sam Goody. Well, they, his family owned Sam Goody Records. So we got involved with them, and, in the, and we had a, a, we were dominant because we had the rap attack, which we could play our songs on. We had the record company, and we had the stores. So that was how Cold, the significance of Cold Chillin' is the only record label that was created from a radio show. Yeah, because, you know, when I was really doing the, the, the math on that, I'm like, to your point, you know, to have a record label and have one of the biggest radio shows in your city. No, the biggest. The biggest. And the cops talk your shit. <laughs> the biggest is crazy, you know? And so, and then as I'm digging in and I'm hearing more stories, apparently, so tell me you were, uh, they told me that you were roommates at one point with Russell Simmons and Andre Harrell. Yeah, me, Russell Simmons, and Andre Harrell used to live. We're roommates. We had a one room apartment. Not one bedroom, one room for everybody. <laughs> we had a pull out chair and a pull out couch. And I slept on the pull out chair, Russell and Andre slept on the pull out couch. I wasn't with sleeping with other guys. <laughs> so, so, but in that, when I look back, in that apartment, that little studio apartment, think about it. We, we, we spawned, we started cold chilling uptown at the Dev Chain. Three dominant labels, all right? In fact, there was a time when we were the big three. And... We just, you know, we, and it's all because we had an ambition. And even though we didn't have money in the beginning, we still thought we was the shit. <laughs> you know, and you didn't have money, and, 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 um, but you have to keep going, you know. And that's why, you know, a lot of young people today expect things to happen overnight. There is no magic wand, all right? You got to work for it. You got to make it happen. And, and you can't believe in anything anybody says because everybody gonna tell you you can't do it. Just because. You know, I get to this Apollo situation back in 1988. I went to booking agencies. They told me I couldn't sell out the Apollo. And I said, wait a minute, I got Big Daddy Kane, Roxanne Shantae, MC Shan, Gucci Rap, Molly Marl, Craig G, Tragedy. If I can't sell out the Apollo, I need to stop. Not only did we sell it out, we sold out four nights. Now, with the Apollo, and we're going to get into some footage in, in this after this question. Um, you said you went to a booking agent. Was it? Did you feel like you could just come to the venue and talk to them yourself? Or did you have those type of relationships? I just came and rented the Apollo. You just came and rented it. See, my own one. Fly time for a reason. <laughs> All right. Okay. And at the time, the Sutton family owned it which was the same people that owned WBLS. Sad to say, they didn't believe in it either. That's right. They did not see it happening. In fact, they weren't even gonna let Mr. Magic host it because he had to be on the radio. But I, I kind of I said, well, we sell it out, can he host? They said, yes. The next day, the controller at the Apollo called the general manager at BLS and said, the first show sold out in 20 minutes. We need more shows. So how did you bring Ralph into it? Okay, Ralph, I go back with Ralph. Ralph's first video was my first video. Ralph's first video was Roxanne's Revenge. I had $2,000. He was trying, starting out with his company, Classic Concept, we did it. The next video he did was called Left Me Lonely by MC Shane. I called Ralph, I said, Ralph, I got $8,000, that's it. I don't have $8,000 and 10 cents. I got 8,000, all right? If you do this, and I didn't say if I make it, I said, when I make it, I'll put you on. And that Left Me Lonely album, Left Me Lonely song, made Shane's album Down By Law go gold, which, started majors knocking on my door. And I turned them down, Warner, Capital, whoever, because I just didn't like the term major. It sounded too much like master to me. And I didn't want to be down with that. 
But, you know, they gave me one of them offers I couldn't refuse. And um, I took it. And as long as I owned my masters, I didn't care. Now, I want to tell you, not, I don't want to make you think I was so intelligent. Somebody told me, a guy named Joe Robinson and his wife Sylvia Robinson, they own Sylvia Hill Records. And when they found out I was going to make this deal, they came to my house. And Joe said, whatever you do, don't give them your masters. He said, they're going to offer you a lot of money for your masters. Don't take it. That's your pension plan. I got a good pension plan. Shout out to Joe. Shout out to Joe. I think we're going to show, are we going to bring someone on or are we going to show a quick clip? Let's do that. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for my guy right here, Mr. Ralph McDaniels. What up? What up, New York City? You already know. So, Uncle Ralph, you already know, we all grew up to this. Thank you. 40 years of video music box. Yes, yeah. sir. So this, this special night, and I remember, you know, I was hella young watching, you know, the music videos you were directing back then, and obviously, you know, the video music box. Tell us about how this night came together. Um, well, anytime you dealt with the Juice Crew, it was always, it was, it, these are real artists, you know, and, and these are not like guys that were industry, they was coming from the block, you know, right to the stage, you know, so you had to be, you know, focused. And to just organize these guys was always a problem. And Ty would be saying, hey, look, get in contact with them. And Magic would be around and I'd go, okay, we're gonna get in contact with everybody. Make sure everybody meets us at the Apollo. Because the Apollo, as everybody knows, if you were from back in the days, that backstage would be hectic back there, right? And, and so the idea of us shooting this whole um, uh, footage was people were trying to get in. We shot some people faking like they were trying to get into the Apollo. And then at the end they didn't get in, and um, and that was the story behind what we, me and my partner Lionel Martin did. And so when we got here, you know, Ty and Magic and, and Molly and and everybody was you know excited. This is the Apollo. You know, we didn't have too many places back in the days for to, for hip hop to be you know showcased. But when you got an opportunity to do a place like the Apollo, you know you had to show and prove. Plus. You know, most of these artists is not from Harlem, so we had to show Harlem, like, yo, we got it. We're from Brooklyn, Queens, and everywhere else. These guys got it, and so it was a big deal to them. Brooklyn. And you know, for me, you know, for all, I think doing a show at the Apollo was my dream. It was a dream. And then I found out that everybody's dream that was involved was to do a show at the Apollo. So it wasn't hard to get Ralph. It wasn't hard to convince the artists. Everybody's dream was to play the Apollo. I tell you too, you know, at, at first, you know, the Apollo was like, look, we don't want nothing crazy going on in here with these hip hop dudes and these girls, because it's 1988. Hip hop ain't blown up like that yet. So I had to convince, who was it, Mary Flowers I was doing? Mary with? Flowers. Mary yeah. Flowers. And tell her, look, it's gonna be fine. She's like, Ralph, don't let nothing happen in this play. I'm like, it's gonna be fine. Everybody's happy. They're gonna have a good time. They come and dress. They're gonna be looking good, and the artists are gonna do their thing, and we're gonna have a good time. And it was an amazing concert, and and one of the early hip hop concerts in New York that just, you know, resonated across the country and now across the world because everywhere, from from Japan to Germany to Africa to Brazil to where you name it, they know about the Juice Crew. That was an incredible, you know, as I think about how hard it was for us booking venues, you know, in the '90s. You know, I could imagine during the crack era, right, where a venue like this is trying to make sure that everything is perfect. No, you had your, look, the, the, it was double parked out in the front, every, the whole block. All your favorite drug dealers was up here. All the baddies was up in here. It was official. Is that what they called them back then, baddies? <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. The shorties. Yeah, and you know, I think you saw one of the clips where one of the ushers that work here was talking about no fights, no problem, because at hip-hop shows back then, there was always trouble. And, but we knew because, rest in peace, Mr. Magic. Mr. Magic could control an audience. He was gonna have you entertained. So you weren't gonna have time to think about fighting. 
You just gonna keep your mind focused on the stage. So, and we had artists that performed very well. And Ty, prior to that, it was a bunch of guys at a hip hop show, right? We was all in there, you know, bobbing our heads. Once you start putting Big Daddy Kane in the mix, all the women came out, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and that mixed it up, so everybody started looking around. We're not fighting each other, now we're checking out the girls, you know? And so that was what was happening in here. It was a nice mixture, balanced. So now I hear from a production standpoint, you went all out. I mean, Several we, cameras. Yeah, no, we asked for a couple of extra cameras. Um, big up my partner, Lionel Martin, the big kid from Video Music Box. A um, couple of extra cameras. And it was basically like they had Showtime at the Apollo with a couple of extra cameras that we needed for just to give it more like a, a, a live feel, you know, in, in, in like a, a street kind of hood feel. And the back door. We needed cameras at the back door because that's the only images we knew at that point. You know, right. we were trying to get in. We never could get in. So we had to show that because everybody could relate to that part of it. It was supposed to come out as a DVD and a VHS. It never came out. Right. I had to take... The, 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 the edited version of this show that y'all are looking at in my house for since then, 1988 till till about seven months ago when the Apollo called me and said we have these tapes and they're yours and, I'm, and you're in it and I was like what is it? And it was like Big Daddy said well it's not mine it's cold chilling we did it together it was a cold thing and all right let's let's take a look at it me and Ty came in with uh, Brad who's in charge of archives that's why archiving is so important and we looked at all the tapes and all of it was from backstage. And I said, Brad, I have the front stage of it. I have it from this from this angle. And he was like, okay, but well, we don't have the masters. We have it with the time code on it and numbers on it. And I said, that's just as good. So you, you need to use that. I mean, Biz Marquis' show was incredible. You know, the DJs, Mr. C and all the DJs came out. You know, Kane, it, it was amazing. So crazy. And now, you know, it wasn't free. <laughs> all right. Um, the Apollo charged me $125,000 to do that. And I called Warner Brothers to pay for it. They said, okay, we're going to send our guy to, to direct it. And I said, you can't direct my dream. I'll pay for it. And I'll never forget the late honorable person Sutton said, you have $125,000. <laughs> I said, I have a record label. We make money. So once... That taught me another lesson, and when you, when you put your own money up, you control everything. And that's exactly what happened. So, Ralph and I always had a great rapport with videos, so whatever he needed, whatever he had to do, he got it. I love it, man. And so, just so everybody's following the story, right? Because you got this amazing concert that happened, you have all of this history leading up to this night, you have footage and, and direction coming from you know, Uncle Ralph here. The front is shot, but the backstage where all the magic is happening is lost. So apparently some footage was burned in a fire and while moving some things here at the Apollo, they found the tape. Let's go to the video real quick and show them a little bit of what we're talking about. 